Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Thank you for your patience as I sort out my personal life and we get a schedule going here. We're going to start with every Wednesday and hopefully more often than that. But we're going back to our roots with another Lovecraft story. This one is called The Electric Executioner by H.P. Lovecraft and Adolfe de Castro. And now, on with our story time. For one who has never faced the danger of legal execution, I have a very strange horror of the electric chair as a subject. Indeed, I think the topic gives me more of a shudder than it gives many a man who has been on trial for his life. The reason is that I associate the thing with an incident of 40 years ago. A very strange incident, which brought me close to the edge of the unknown's black abyss. In 1899, I was an auditor and investigator connected with the Toxala Mining Company of San Francisco. It operated several small silver and copper properties in the San Mateo Mountains in Mexico. There had been some trouble at mine number three, which had a surly third of assistant superintendent named Arthur Felden. And on August 6th, the firm received a telegram saying that Felden had decamped, taking with him all the stock records, securities, and private papers, and leaving the entire clerical and financial situation in dire confusion. The development was a severe blow to the company, and... Late in the afternoon, President McComb called me into his office to give orders for the recovery of the papers at any cost. There were, he knew, gray drawbacks. I had never seen Felden, and there were only very indifferent photographs to go by. Moreover, my own wedding was set for Thursday of the following week, only nine days ahead so that I was naturally not eager to be hurried off to Mexico on a mainland of indefinite length. The need, however, was so great that Macomb felt justified in asking me to go at once, and I, for my part, decided that the effect of my status with the company would make ready acquiescence eminently worthwhile. I was to start that night, using the president's private car as far as Mexico City, after which I would have to take a narrow gauge railway to the mines. Jackson, the superintendent of number three, would give me all the details and any possible clues upon my arrival, and then the search would begin in earnest, through the mountains, down to the coast, or among the byways of Mexico City, as the case might be. I set out with a grim determination to get the matter done, and successfully done, as swiftly as possible, and I tempered my discontent with pictures of an early return with papers and culprit, and of a wedding which would be an almost triumphal ceremony. Having notified my family, fiancé, and principal friends, and made hasty preparations for the trip. I met President McComb at 8 p.m. at the Southern Pacific Depot, received from him some written instructions in a checkbook, and left in his car attached to the 815 eastbound transcontinental train. The journey that followed seemed destined for uneventfulness, and after a good night's sleep, I reveled in the ease of the private car so thoughtfully assigned to me, reading my instructions with care, and formulating plans for the capture of Belden and the recovery of the documents. I knew the Tlaxcala country quite well, probably much better than the missing man. Hence, I had a certain amount of advantage in my search, unless he already used the railway. According to the instructions, Felden had been a subject of worry to Superintendent Jackson for some time. At 
acting secretively and working unaccountably in the company's laboratory at odd hours. That he was implicated with a Mexican boss and several peons and some thefts of ore was strongly suspected. But though the natives had been discharged, there was not enough evidence to warrant any positive step regarding the subtle official. Indeed, despite his furtiveness, there seemed to be more of defiance than of guilt in the man's bearing. He wore a chip on his shoulder and talked as if the company were cheating him instead of his cheating the company. The obvious surveillance of his colleagues, Jackson wrote, appeared to irritate him increasingly. And now he had gone with everything of importance in the office, of his possible whereabouts, no guess could be made. Though, Jackson's final telegram suggested the wild slopes of the Sierra to Malinche, that tall, mist-surrounded peak with the corpse-shaped silhouette from whose neighborhood the thieving natives were said to have come. At El Paso, where we reached at 2 a.m. of the following night, my private car was detached from the transcontinental train and joined to an engine specially ordered by telegraph to take it southward to Mexico City. I continued to drowse until dawn, and all the next day grew bored on the flat, desert, chihuahua landscape. The crew had told me we were due in Mexico City at noon Friday but I soon saw that countless delays were wasting precious hours. There were waits on sidelings all along the single-tracked route, and now and then a hot box or other difficulty would further complicate the schedule. At Torreon, we were six hours late, and it was almost eight o'clock on Friday evening, fully twelve hours behind schedule. The conductor consented to do some speeding, in an effort to make up time. My nerves were on edge, and I could do nothing but pace the car in desperation. In the end, I found that the speeding had been purchased at a high cost indeed, for within a half an hour, the symptoms of a hot box had developed in my car itself, so that after a maddening wait, the crew decided that all the bearings would have to be overhauled after a quarter-speed limp. Ahead to the next station was shops, the factory town of Cuerotaro. This was the last straw, and I almost stamped like a child. Actually, I sometimes caught myself pushing at my chair arm, as if trying to urge the train forward at a less snail-like pace. It was almost ten in the evening when we drew into Cuerotaro and I spent a fretful hour on the station platform while my car was sidetracked and tinkered at by a dozen native mechanics. At last, they told me the job was too much for them, since the forward truck needed new parts which could not be obtained nearer than Mexico City. Everything indeed seemed against me, and I gritted my teeth when I thought of Belden getting farther and farther away. Perhaps to the easy cover of Veracruz with its shipping, or Mexico City with its varied rail facilities. Meanwhile, fresh delays kept me tied and helpless. Of course, Jackson had notified the police in all the cities around, but I knew with sorrow what their efficiency amounted to. The best I could do, as I soon found out, was to take the regular night express for Mexico City, it ran from Aguas Calientes and made a five-minute stop in Queotaro. It would be along at 1 a.m., if on time, and was due in Mexico City at 5 o'clock, Saturday morning. When I purchased my ticket, I found that the train would be made up of European compartment carriages instead of long American cars with rows of two-chair seats. These had been much used in the early days of Mexican railroading, owing to the European construction interests back of the first lines. And, in 1899, the Mexican Central was still running a fair number of them on its shorter trips, 
Ordinarily, I prefer the American couches, since I hate to have people facing me. But for this once, I was glad of the foreign carriage. At such a time of night, I stood a good chance of having an entire compartment to myself. And, in my tired, nervously hypersensitive state, I welcomed the solitude. As well as the comfortably upholstered seat with soft armrests and head cushion running the whole width of the vehicle. I bought a first-class ticket, obtained my valet from the sidetracked private car, telegraphed both President McComb and Jackson of what had happened, and settled down in the station to wait for the night express as patiently as my strained nerves would let me. For a wonder, the train was only half an hour late, though even so, the solitary station vigil had about finished my endurance. The conductor, showing me into a compartment, told me he expected to make up the delay and reach the capital on time, and I stretched myself comfortably on the forward-facing seat. I expected a quiet three-and-a-half-hour run. The light from the overhead oil lamp was soothingly dim, and I wondered whether I could snatch some much-needed sleep in spite of my anxiety and nerve tension. It seemed, as the train jolted into motion, that I was alone, and I was heartily glad of it. My thoughts leaped ahead to my quest, and I nodded with the accelerating rhythm of the speeding string of carriages. Then suddenly, I perceived that I was not alone after all. In the corner, Diagonally opposite me, slumped down so that his face was invisible, sat a roughly clad man of unusual size, whom the feeble light failed to reveal before. Beside him on the seat was a huge briefcase, battered and bulging, entirely gripped even in his sleep by one of his incongruously slender hands. As the engine whistled sharply at some curve or crossing, the sleeper started nervously into a kind of watchful, half-awakening. Raising his head and disclosing a handsome face, bearded and clearly Anglo-Saxon, with dark, lustrous eyes. At sight of me, his wakefulness became complete, and I wondered at the rather hostile wildness of his glance. No doubt, I thought. He resented my presence when he had hoped to have a compartment alone all the way, just as I was myself disappointed to find strange company in this half-lighted carriage. The best we could do, however, was to accept the situation gracefully, so I began apologizing to the man for my intrusion. He seemed to be a fellow American, and we could both feel more at ease after a few civilities. Then, we could leave each other in peace for the balance of the journey. To my surprise, the stranger did not respond to my courtesies with so much as a word. Instead, he kept staring at me fiercely and almost appraisingly, and brushed aside my embarrassed proffer of a cigar with a nervous lateral movement of his disengaged hand. His other hand, still tensely clutched the great, worn briefcase, and his entire person seemed to radiate some obscure malignity. After a time, he abruptly turned his face toward the window, though there was nothing to see in the dense blackness outside. Oddly, he appeared to be looking at something as intently as if there really were something to look at. I decided to leave him to his own curious devices and meditations without further annoyance. So I settled back in my seat, drew the brim of my soft hat over my face, and closed my eyes, as was my effort to snatch the sleep I had half counted on. I could not have dozed very long, 
or very fully, my eyes fell open as if in response to some external force. Closing them again with determination, I renewed my quest of a nap, yet wholly without avail. An intangible influence seemed bent on keeping me awake. So raising my head, I looked about the dimly lighted compartment to see if anything were amiss. All appeared normal, but I noticed that the stranger in the opposite corner was looking at me very intently. Intently, though, without any of the geniality or friendliness which would have implied a change from his former surly attitude. I did not attempt conversation at this time, but leaned back in my previous sleepy posture, half closing my eyes, as if I had dozed off once more, yet continuing to watch him curiously from beneath my downturned hat brim. As the train rattled onward through the night, I saw a subtle and gradual metamorphosis come over the expression of the staring man, evidently satisfied that I was asleep. He allowed his face to reflect a curious jumble of emotions, the nature of which seemed anything but reassuring. Hatred, fear, triumph, and fanaticism flickered compositely over the lines of his lips and the angles of his eyes, while his gaze became a glare of really alarming greed and curiosity. Suddenly it dawned upon me that this man was mad, and dangerously so. I will not pretend that I was anything but deeply and thoroughly frightened when I saw how things stood. Perspiration started out all over me, and I had hard work to maintain my attitude of relaxation and slumber. Life had many attractions for me just then, and the thought of dealing with a homicidal maniac, possibly armed and certainly powerful to a marvelous degree, was a dismaying and terrifying one. My disadvantage in any sort of struggle was enormous, for the man was a virtual giant, evidently the best, athletically trim, while I have always been rather frail, and was then almost worn out with anxiety, sleeplessness, and nervous tension. It was undeniably a bad moment for me, and I felt pretty close to a horrible death, as I recognized the fury of madness in the stranger's eyes. Events from the past, came up into my consciousness as if for a farewell. Just as a drowning man's whole life is said to resurrect itself before him at the last moment. Of course, I had my revolver in my coat pocket, but any motion of mine to reach and draw it would be instantly obvious. Moreover, if I did secure it, there was no telling what effect it would have on the maniac. Even if I shot him once or twice, he might have enough remaining strength to get the gun from me and deal with me in his own way. Or if he were armed himself, he might shoot or stab without trying to disarm me. One can cow a sane man by covering him with a pistol, but an insane man's complete indifference to consequences gives him a strength and menace quite superhuman for the time being. Even in those pre-Freudian days, I had a common sense realization of the dangerous power of a person without normal inhibitions, that the stranger in the corner was indeed about to start some murderous action. His burning eyes and twitching facial muscles did not permit me to doubt for a moment. Suddenly, I heard his breath begin to come in excited gasps and saw his chest heaving with mounting excitement. The time for a showdown was close, and I desperately tried to think of the best thing to do. Without interrupting my pretense of sleep, I began to slide my right hand gradually and inconspicuously toward the pocket containing my pistol. 
watching the madman closely as I did so, to see if he would detect any move. Unfortunately, he did, almost before he had had time to register the fact in his expression. With a bound so agile and abrupt as to be almost incredible on a man of his size, he was upon me before I knew what had happened, looming up and swaying forward like a giant ogre of legend, and pinioning me with one powerful hand, while with the other he forestalled me in reaching the revolver, taking it from my pocket and placing it in his own. He released me contemptuously, well knowing how fully his physique placed me at his mercy. Then he stood up at his full height, his head almost touching the roof of the carriage, and stared down at me with eyes whose fury had quickly turned to a look of pitying scorn and ghoulish calculation. I did not move, and after a moment the man resumed his seat opposite me, smiling a ghastly smile as he opened his great bulging briefcase. And then he extracted an article of peculiar appearance, a rather large cage of semi-flexible wire, woven somewhat like a baseball catcher's mask, which shaped more like the helmet of a diving suit. Its top was connected with a cord, whose other end remained in the briefcase. The device he fondled with obvious affection, cradling it in his lap as he looked at me afresh and licked his bearded lips with an almost feline motion of the tongue. Then, for the first time, he spoke in a deep, mellow voice of softness and cultivation, startlingly at variance with his rough, corduroy clothes and unkempt aspect. You are fortunate, sir, he said. I shall use you first of all. You shall go into history as the first fruits of remarkable invention. Vast sociological consequences. I shall let my light shine, as it were. I'm radiating all the time, but nobody knows it. Now you shall know. Intelligent guinea pig. Cats and burrows. It even worked with a burrow. He paused, while his bearded features underwent a convulsive motion, closely synchronized with the vigorous, gyratory shaking of his whole head. It was as though he were shaking clear of some nebulous, obstructing medium, for the gesture was followed by a clarification or subtilization of expression, which hid the more obvious madness in a look of suave composure through which the craftiness gleamed only dimly. I glimpsed the difference at once, and I put in a word to see if I could lead his mind into harmless channels. I said, You seem to have a marvelously fine instrument, if I'm any judge. Won't you tell me how you came to invent it? He nodded. Mere logical reflection, dear sir, he said. I consulted the needs of the age and acted upon them. Others might have done the same had their minds been as powerful, that is, as capable of sustained concentration as mine. I had the sense of conviction, the available willpower, that is all. I realized, as no one else has yet realized, how imperative it is to remove everybody from the earth before Quetzalcoatl comes back, and realized also that it must be done elegantly. I hate butchery of any kind, and hanging is barbarously crude. You know, last year the New York legislature voted to adopt electric execution for condemned men, but the apparatus they had in mind is as primitive as Stetson's rocket or Davenport's first electric engine. I knew of a better way, and told them so, but they paid no attention to me. The fools. As if I didn't know all there is to know about men and death, and electricity. Student, man and boy. Technologist, 
engineer, soldier of fortune. He leaned back and narrowed his eyes. I was in Maximilian's army twenty years and more ago. They were going to make me a nobleman. And those damned greasers killed him and I had to go home. But I came back, back and forth, back and forth. I live in Rochester, New York. His eyes grew deeply crafty, and he leaned forward, touching me on the knee with the fingers of a paradoxically delicate hand. I came back, I say, and I went deeper than any of them. I hate greasers, but I like Mexicans. A puzzle. Listen to me, young fellow. You don't think Mexico is really Spanish, do you? If you knew the tribes, I know. His voice changed into a chanting, an unmelodious howl. He spoke words that I'd never heard before, talking of caves, deities, chants. Then he screamed, No one shall ever know. I tell you, because you will never repeat it. He subsided and resumed a conversational tone. It would surprise you to know what things are told in the mountains? Hutzilo Pochli is coming back. Of that, there can be no doubt. Any peon south of Mexico City can tell you that. But I meant to do nothing about it. I went home, as I tell you, again and again. It was going to benefit society with my electric executioner. When that cursed, Albany legislature adopted the other way. A joke, sir, a joke. Grandfather's chair, sit by the fireside. The man was chuckling with a morbid parody of good nature. He continued, Why, sir, I'd like to be the first man to sit in their damned chair and feel their tumid battery current. It would make a frog's legs dance, and they expect to kill murderers with it. Reward of merit, everything. But then, young man, I saw the uselessness, the pointless illogity, as it were, of killing just a few. Everybody is a murderer. They murder ideas, steal inventions, stole mine by watching, and watching, and watching. The man choked and paused, and I spoke soothingly. I'm sure your invention was much better, and probably they'll come to use it in the end. Evidently, my tact was not great enough, for his response showed fresh irritation. Sure, are you, he said. Nice, mild, conservative assurance. Cursed a lot, you care. But you'll soon know. Why? All the good there will ever be in that electric chair will have been stolen from me. The ghost of Nezahal Pili told me that on the sacred mountain. They watched and watched, watched. He choked again, then gave another of those gestures in which he seemed to shake both his head and his facial expression. That seemed temporarily to steady him. What my invention needs is testing. That is it, here. The wire hood or head net is flexible and slips on easily. Neck piece binds but doesn't choke. Electrodes touch forehead and base of cerebellum, all that's necessary. Stop the head, and what else can go? The fools up at Albany, with their carved oak easy chair, think they've got to make a head-to-foot affair. Idiots, don't they know that you don't need to shoot a man through the body after you plugged him through the brain? I've seen men die in battle. I know better. And then their silly high power circuit, dynamos, all that. Why didn't they see what I've done with the storage battery? Not a hearing. Nobody knows. I alone have the secret. That's why I... And Quetzalcoatl and Hood Zilo Pochli will rule the world alone. I and they, 
if I choose to let them. But I must have experimental subjects. Subjects. Do you know who I've chosen first? I tried, jocoseness, quickly merging into friendly seriousness as I set it up. Quick thought, the napped words might save me yet, I thought. Well, I said, there were lots of fine subjects among the politicians of San Francisco, where I come from. They need your treatment, and I'd like to help you introduce it. But really, I think I can help you in all truth. I have some influence in Sacramento, and if you'll go back to the States with me after I'm through with my business in Mexico, I'll see that you get a hearing. He answered soberly and civilly. No, I can't go back. I swore not to when those criminals at Albany turned down my invention and set spies to watch me and steal from me. But I must have American subjects. Those creasers are under a curse and would be too easy. And the real children of the feathered serpent are sacred and inviolate except for proper sacrificial victims, and even those must be slain according to ceremony. I must have Americans without going back. And the first man I choose will be signally honored. Do you know who he is? I temporized desperately and said, Oh, if that's all the trouble, I'll find you a dozen specimens as soon as we get to Mexico City. I know where there are lots of small mining men, who wouldn't be missed for days. But he cut me short with a new and sudden air of authority, which had a touch of real dignity in it. That'll do. We've trifled long enough, he said. Get up and stand erect like a man. You're the subject I've chosen, and you'll thank me for the honor in the other world, just as the sacrificial victim thanks the priest for transferring him to eternal glory. A new principle. No other man alive has dreamed of such a battery, and it might never again be hit on if the world experimented for a thousand years. Do you know atoms aren't what they seem? Fools. I rose at his command. He drew additional feet of cord from the briefcase and stood erect beside me wire helmet outstretched toward me in both hands, and a look of real exaltation on his tanned and bearded face. For an instant, he seemed like a radiant Hellenic mystagogue or hierophant. Here, O oh youth, he said, a libation, wine of the cosmos, nectar of the starry spaces, Linos, Lacus, Lominos, Zagreus, Dionysos, Atius, Hylus, sprung from Apollo, and slain by the hounds of Argos, seed of Samanthe, child of the sun. He was chanting again, and this time his mind seemed far back among the classic memories of his college days. In my erect posture, I noticed the nearness of the signal cord overhead and wondered whether I can reach it through some gesture or ostensible response to a ceremonial mood. It was worth trying. So, with an antiphonal cry of evil, I put my hands forward and upward toward him in a ritualistic fashion, hoping to give the cord a tug before he could notice the act. But it was useless. He saw my purpose and moved one hand toward the right-hand coat pocket where my revolver lay. No words were needed, and we stood for a moment like carven figures. Then he quietly said, Make haste. Again my mind rushed frantically about, seeking avenues of escape. The doors I knew were not locked on Mexican trains, but my companion could easily forestall me if I tried to unlatch one and jump out. Besides, our speed was so great that success in that direction would probably be as fatal as failure. The only thing to do was to play for time. 
Of the three and a half hour trip, a good slice was already worn away. And once we got to Mexico City, the guards and police in the station would provide instant safety. There would, I thought, be two distinct times for diplomatic stalling. If I could get him to postpone the slipping of the hood, that much time would be gained. Of course, I had no belief that the thing was really deadly, but I knew enough of madmen to understand what would happen when it failed to work. To his disappointment would be added a mad sense of my responsibility for the failure, and the result would be a red chaos of murderous rage. Therefore, the experiment must be postponed as long as possible. Yet, the second opportunity did exist, for if I planned cleverly, I might devise explanations for the failure which would hold his attention and lead him into more or less extended searches for corrective influences. I wondered just how far his credulity went and whether I could prepare in advance the prophecy of failure which would make the failure itself a stamp me as a seer, or initiate, or perhaps a god. I had enough of a smattering of Mexican mythology to make it worth trying, though I would try other delaying influences first, and let the prophecy come as a sudden revelation. Would he spare me in the end, or could I make him think me a prophet or divinity? Could I get by? as Quetzalcoatl or Hudzilopochtli. Anything to drag matters out until five o'clock when we were due in Mexico City. But my opening stall was the veteran will-making ruse. As the maniac repeated his command for haste, I told him of my family and intended marriage and asked for the privilege of leaving a message and disposing my money and effects. If, I said, he would lend me some paper and agree to mail what I would write. I would die more peacefully and willingly. After some cogitation, he gave a favorable verdict and fished in his briefcase for a pad, which he handed me solemnly as I resumed my seat. I produced a pencil, artfully breaking the point at the outset and causing some delay while I searched for one of his own. And he gave me this, he took my broken pencil and proceeded to sharpen it with a large, horn-handled knife, which had been in his belt under his coat. Evidently, a second pencil breaking would not profit me greatly. What I wrote, I can hardly recall at this date. It was largely gibberish and composed of random scraps of memorized literature when I could think of nothing else to set down. I made my handwriting as illegible as I could without destroying its nature as writing, for I knew he would likely look at the result before commencing his experiment and realized how he would react to the sight of obvious nonsense. The ordeal was a terrible one, and I chafed each second at the slowness of the train. In the past, I had often whistled a brisk gallop to the sprightly tack of wheels on rails, but now the tempo seemed slowed down to that of a funeral march. My funeral march, I grimly reflected. My ruse worked till I'd covered over four pages, six by nine, when at last the madman drew out his watch and told me I could have but five minutes more. What should I do next? I was hastily going through the form of concluding the will when a new idea struck me, ending with a flourish and handing him the finished sheets, which he thrust carelessly into his left-hand coat pocket. I reminded him of my influential Sacramento friends, who would be so much more interested in his invention. Oughtn't I to give you a letter of introduction to them, I said. Oughtn't I to make a signed sketch and description of your executioner, so they'll grant you a cordial hearing? They can make you famous, you know, and there's no question at all, but that they'll adopt your method for the state of California if they hear of it through someone like me, whom they know and trust. I was taking this tack on the chance 
that his thoughts as a disappointed inventor would let him forget the Aztec religious side of his mania for a while. When he veered to the ladder again, I reflected I would spring the revelation and prophecy. The scheme worked, for his eyes glowed an eager assent, though he brusquely told me to be quick. He further emptied the briefcase, lifting out a strange-looking congress of glass cells and coils, to which the wire from the helmet was attached, and delivering a fire of running comment too technical for me to follow, yet apparently quite plausible and straightforward. I pretended to note down all that he said, wondering as I did so whether this strange apparatus was really a battery, after all. Would I get a slight shock when he applied the device? The man surely talked as if he were a genuine electrician. Description of his own invention was clearly a congenial task for him, and I saw he was not as impatient as before. The hopeful gray of dawn glimmered red through the windows before he wound up, and I felt at last that my chance of escape had really become tangible. But he too saw the dawn and began glaring wildly again. He knew the train was due in Mexico City at five, and would certainly force quick action unless I could override all his judgment with engrossing ideas. As he rose with a determined air, setting the battery on the seat beside the open briefcase, I reminded him that I had not made the needed sketch, and asked him to hold the headpiece so that I could draw it near the battery. He complied and resumed his seat, with many admonitions to me to hurry. After another moment, I paused for some information, asking him how the victim was placed for execution, and how his presumable struggles were overcome. Why, he replied, the criminal is securely strapped to a post. It does not matter how much he tosses his head, for the helmet fits tightly and draws even closer when the current comes on. We turn the switch gradually. You see it here, a carefully arranged affair with the rheostat. A new idea for delay occurred to me, as the tilled fields and increasingly frequent houses in the dawn night outside told of our approach to the capital at last. But, I said, I must draw the helmet in place on a human head as well as beside the battery. Can't you slip it on a moment so that I can sketch you with it? The papers, as well as the officials, will want all this, and they are strong on completeness. I had, by chance, made a better shot than I had planned. For my mention of the press, the madman's eyes lit up afresh. The papers, he said. Yes, damn them. You can't even make the papers give me a hearing. They all laughed at me and wouldn't print a word. Here, you, hurry up. We've not a second to lose. He slipped the headpiece on and was watching my pencil flying avidly. The wire mesh gave him a grotesque, comic look as he sat there nervously twitching hands. Now, curse them. They'll print pictures. I'll revise your sketch if you make any blunders. It must be accurate at any cost. Police will find you afterward. They'll tell how it works. Associated Press. Item. Back up your letter. Immortal Flame. Hurry, I say. Hurry. Confound you. The train was lurching over the poorer roadbed near the city. And we swayed disconcertingly now and then. With this excuse, I managed to break the pencil again. But of course... The maniac at once handed me my own, which he had sharpened. My first batch of ruses was all used up, and I felt that I should have to submit the headpiece in a moment. We were still a good quarter hour from the terminal, and it was about time for me to divert my companion to his religious side and spring the divine prophecy, mustering up my scraps from Nahuan Aztec mythology. I suddenly threw down pencil and paper and commenced to chant. I called on every deity I knew and chanted and chanted. 
and my soul echoes the thunder, I said. At my intonations, the maniac stared incredulously through his odd mask. His handsome face shone in a surprise and perplexity, which quickly changed to alarm. His mind seemed to go blank a moment, and then to recrystallize in another pattern. Raising his hands aloft, he chanted as if in a dream. He cried to his deities, Aztec, Cthulhu, said he would serve. Now, in all this responsive gibberish, there was one word which struck an odd chord in my memory. Odd, because it never occurs in any printed account of Mexican mythology, yet had been overheard by me more than once, as an awe-struck whisper amongst the peons in my own firm's minds. It seemed to be part of an exceedingly secret and ancient ritual, for there were characteristic whispered responses which I had caught now and then and which were as unknown as itself to academic scholarship. This maniac must have spent considerable time with the Hilpions, just as he had said, for surely unrecorded lore could have come from no mere book learning. Realizing the importance he must attach to this doubly esoteric jargon, I determined to strike at his most vulnerable spot, and give him the gibberish responses the natives used. I cried, Ya Ralea, Ya Ralea, Kethilu Vlachin, Nagrulu Yig, Yag, Sotol. But I never had a chance to finish. He galvanized in a religious epilepsy by the exact response, which his subconscious mind had probably not really expected. The madman scrambled down to a kneeling posture, on the floor, bowing his wire, helmeted head again and again, and turning it to the right and left as he did so. With each turn, his obeisances became more profound, and I could hear his foaming lips repeating the syllable, kill, kill, in a rapidly swelling monotone. It occurred to me that I had overreached myself, and that my response had unloosed a mounting mania, which might rouse him to the slaying point before the train reached the station. As the arc of the madman's turnings gradually increased, the slack in the cord from his headpiece to the battery had naturally been taken up more and more. Now, in an all-forgetting delirium of ecstasy, he began to magnify his turns to complete circles so that the cord wound around his neck and began to tug at its moorings in the battery seat. I wondered what he would do when the inevitable would happen, and the battery would be dragged to presumable destruction on the floor. Then came sudden cataclysm. The battery, yanked over the seat's edge by the maniac's last gesture of orgiastic frenzy, did indeed fall but it did not seem to have wholly broken. Instead, as my eye caught the spectacle in one too fleeting instant, the actual impact was borne by the rheostat, so that the switch was jerked over instantly to full current. And the marvelous thing is that there was a current. The invention was no mere dream of insanity. I saw a blinding blue oral coruscation heard a ululating shriek more hideous than any of the previous cries of that mad, horrible journey, and smelled the nauseous odor of burning flesh. That was all my overwrought consciousness could bear, and I sank instantly into oblivion. When the train guard at Mexico City revived me, I found a crowd on the station platform around my compartment door. At my involuntary cry, the pressing faces became curious and dubious, and I was glad when the guard shut out all but the trim doctor, who had pushed his way through to me. My cry was a very natural thing, but it had been prompted by something more than the shocking sight on the carriage floor, which I had expected to see, or should say, by something less 
because in truth, there was not anything on the floor at all. Nor said the guard, had there been, and he opened the door and found me unconscious within. My ticket was the only one sold for that compartment, and I was the only person found in it. Just myself, my briefcase, nothing more. I had been alone all the way from Caratoro. Guard, doctor, and spectators alike tapped their foreheads significantly at my frantic and insistent questions. Had it all been a dream, or was I indeed mad? I recalled my anxiety and overwrought nerves and shuddered, thanking the guard and doctor, and shaking free of the curious crowd. I staggered into a cab and was taken to the Fonda National, where, after telegraphing Jackson at the mine, I slept until afternoon in an effort to get a grip on myself. I had myself called at one o'clock in time to catch the narrow gauge for the mining country. And when I got up, I found a telegram under the door. It was from Jackson, and said that Felden had been found dead in the mountains that morning, the news reaching the mine about ten o'clock. The papers were all safe, and the San Francisco office had been duly notified. So the entire trip, with its nervous haste and harrowing mental ordeal, had been for nothing. Knowing that Macomb would expect a personal report despite the course of events, I sent another wire ahead and took the narrow gauge after all. Four hours later, I was rattled and jolted into the station of mine number three, where Jackson was waiting to give a cordial greeting. He was so full of the affair at the mine that he did not notice my still shaken and seedy appearance. The superintendent's story was brief, and he told me it as he led me toward the shack up the hillside above, the Aristray, where Felden's body lay. Felden, he said, had always been a strange, sullen character, ever since he was hired the year before, working at some secret mechanical device and complaining of constant espionage, and being disgustingly familiar with the native workmen but he certainly knew the work, the country, and the people. He used to make long trips into the hills where the peons lived, and even to take part in some of their ancient, heathenish ceremonies. He hinted at odd secrets and strange powers as often as he boasted of his mechanical skill. Of late, he had disintegrated rapidly, growing morbidly suspicious of his colleagues, and undoubtedly joining his native friends in ore thieving after his cash got low. He needed unholy amounts of money for something or other, was always having boxes come from laboratories and machine shops in Mexico City or the States. As for the final absconding of all the papers, it was only a crazy gesture of revenge for what he called spying. He was certainly stark mad, for he had gone across country to a hidden cave on the wild slope of the haunted Sierra del Malinche, where no white men live, and had done some amazingly strange things. The cave, which would never have been found but for the final tragedy, was full of hideous old Aztec idols and altars, the latter covered with the charred bones of recent burnt offerings of doubtful nature. The natives would tell nothing. Indeed, they swore they knew nothing. But it was easy to see that the cave was an old rendezvous of theirs, and that Felden had shared their practices to the fullest extent. The searchers had found the place only because of the chanting and the final cry. It had been close to five that morning, and after an all-night encampment the party had begun to pack up for its empty-handed return to the mines. Then somebody had heard the faint rhythms in the distance and knew that one of the noxious old native rituals was being held from some lonely spot up the slope of the corpse-shaped mountain. 
they heard the same old names, Mictlin Tuchli, Tonatia Metzli, Cthulhu, Yaralea, and all the rest. But the strange thing was that some English words were mixed with them. Real white man's English, and no greaser patter. Guided by the sound, they had hastened up the weed-entangled mountainside toward it, and, after a spell of quiet, the shriek had burst upon them. It was a terrible thing, a worse thing than any of them had ever heard before. There seemed to be some smoke, too, and a morbid, acrid smell. Then they stumbled on the cave, its entrance screened by scrub mesquites, but now emitting clouds of faded smoke. It was lighted within, the horrible altars and grotesque images revealed flickeringly by candles, which must have been changed less than an hour before, and on the gravelly floor lay the horror that made all the crowd reel backward. It was Felden, head burned to a crisp by some odd device he had slipped over it, a kind of wire cage connected with a rather shaken-up battery, which had evidently fallen to the floor from a nearby altar pot. When the men saw it, they exchanged glances, thinking of the electric executioner Felden had always boasted of inventing, the thing which everyone had rejected but had tried to steal and copy. The papers were safe, in Felden's open portmanteau, which stood close by. And an hour later, the column of searchers started back for number three, with a grisly burden on an improvised stretcher. That was all. But it was enough to make me turn pale and falter, as Jackson led me up past the arastre to the shed, where he said the body lay. For I was not without imagination, and knew only too well into what hellish nightmare this tragedy somehow supernaturally dovetailed. I knew what I should see inside that gaping door around which the curious miners clustered, and did not flinch when my eyes took in the giant form, the rough corduroy clothes, the oddly delicate hands, the wisps of burnt beard, and the hellish machine itself, battery slightly broken headpiece blackened by the charring of what was inside. The great, bulging portmanteau did not surprise me, and I quailed only at two things, the folded sheets of paper sticking out from the left-hand pocket, and the strange sagging of the corresponding right-hand pocket. In a moment when no one was looking, I reached out and seized the two familiar sheets crushing them in my hand without daring to look at their penmanship. I had to be sorry now, but a kind of panic fear made me burn them that night with averted eyes. They would have been positive proof, or disproof of something. But for that matter, I could still have proof by asking about the revolver the coroner afterward took from that sagging, right-hand coat pocket. I never had the courage to ask about that, because my own revolver was missing after the night on the train. My pocket pencil, too, showed signs of crude and hasty sharpening, unlike the precise pointing I had given it Friday afternoon on the machine in President McComb's private car. So in the end, I went home still puzzled, mercifully puzzled, perhaps, the private car was repaired when I got back to Carataro, but my greatest relief was crossing the Rio Grande into El Paso and the States. By the next Friday, I was in San Francisco again, and the postponed wedding came the following week. As to what really happened that night, as I've said, I simply don't dare to speculate. That chap Felden was insane to start with, and on top of his insanity, he had piled a lot of prehistoric Aztec witch lore that nobody has any right to know. He was really an inventive genius, and that battery must have been the genuine stuff. I heard later how he had been brushed aside in former years by press, public, potentates alike. Too much disappointment isn't good for men of a certain kind. Anyhow, 
Some unholy combination of influences was at work. He had really, by the way, been a soldier of Maximilian's. When I tell my story, most people call me a plain liar. Others lay it to abnormal psychology. And heaven knows I was overwrought. While still others talk of astral projection of some sort. My zeal to catch Felden certainly sent my thoughts ahead toward him. And with all his Indian magic, he'd be about the first one to recognize and meet them. Was he in the railway carriage, or was I in the cave on the corpse-shaped, haunted mountain? What would have happened to me had I not delayed him as I did? I confess, I don't know. And I'm not sure that I want to know. I've never been in Mexico since. And, as I said at the start, I don't enjoy hearing about electric executions. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.